Ladies and gentlemen, invited and distinguished guests, members of the supervisory board, governor of the province of Limburg, mayor of the city of Maastricht, representatives of Belgium, Poland, Ghana, and Ukraine, colleagues, students, and <laughs> alumni, you may be seated. <laughs> This is an illustration of my influence in this <laughs> university. Actually, this is the third time I stand here on this pulpit in the St. Jan's Church, and it is still as difficult as ever to mount these steps dressed up in a gown, and I challenge any of my colleagues to try to do it. I'll see how I will do it when I get down from this pulpit. The first time was exactly 25 years ago, when I was asked to give the university's 14th Dies Natalis lecture of what was then still called the Rijksuniversiteit Limburg. The title of my talk was The Future Isn't What It Used To Be. Not a particularly original title, but one that seemed particularly appropriate in those first days of 1990 with the coming to an end of the Iron Curtain and the expectations of what this radical change could bring about in Europe. The second time was two and a half years ago, when I delivered from the same pulpit my acceptance speech as Rector Magnificus designate, and the title, of, the title of my speech was Maastricht University, with a C and not an S, how Maastricht could again become a university city. This is also the third time I have the pleasure of welcoming you as Rector Magnificus at the Dies Natalis of our university today, its 39th birthday. In my first welcoming speech at the Vrijthof Theater two years ago, I emphasized the particular role and responsibility of the university as growth engine of new economic value, employment, and more broadly development for the region. That role of engine of growth became, I argued, more pronounced in the aftermath of the financial crisis with its accompanying decline in private investment, its rise in bankruptcies, distrust in future opportunities, and rapid growth in, in unemployment. To be, or rather pretend to be, in the process of becoming an elite university, a Harvard on the mass, as some would put it, limiting the number of admitted students to a selected few, wasn't just against the spirit of our student-centered education system, it was also not in line with the changing environment within which the university found itself operating. As our first Dr. Honoris Causa from a societal perspective, the SMCSO CEO Feike Siebesma put it, one cannot achieve success in an environment dominated by failure. Exploiting the university's underutilized growth potential was hence, for me at least, a must. Two years later, and with the help of the provincial authorities, we are now together with our local partners, the Academic Hospital, and Zuid University of Applied Sciences involved in a 10-year growth program investing in the further development of new higher education programs, research fields and institutes, and knowledge transfer in the region. Not Mr. Timmermans, the size of Jean-Claude Juncker's strategic investment plan, and if I may add, not expecting a similar leverage effect in raising additional private funds, but a strategy which looks remarkably similar to what the new commission initiated a couple of months ago and will be implementing this year. Last year, during the 38 years, I discussed the rapid internationalization in the research process itself. That process raises many challenges. Fast, too fast, pressures on realizing research output, an obsession with output metrics, strategic behavior with, in some cases, perverse incentives, and last but not least, increasingly poor career prospects for young researchers whose predicament I compared with members of a drug gang. In short, what I understood as science being in transition. Last year, the Dutch government published its long-awaited 2025 vision on science, which immediately faced a lot of critique, both in the press and within the scientific community, particularly with respect to the proposed changes in the governance of NWO, the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. 
For sure, it will continue to be at the forefront of much debate in the coming months with the forthcoming science agenda, which will be presented later this year by the government. The VSNU, the Dutch Universities Association, already reacted to the government's science vision. My own personal view differs from that of the VSNU. For me, one of the reasons why Europe has not kept up with the high Lisbon expectations in research and innovation over the last decade has everything to do with the dominance within Europe of small countries and hence of small research budgets. The total budget of NWO is with 650 million, less than what the British Wellcome Trust spends annually on just medical research and innovation. And yet with this amount, the Netherlands has, has the sixth largest European public science budget. Furthermore, in some European member states, I won't say which ones, there are countries with regional research budgets. Thus, the annual budget of the Flemish FBO is, for instance, 200 million euros, four times that of the Luxembourg FNR of 50 million euros. To imagine that one could just add up all those different national and regional science budgets representing total European research efforts, comparable to the US, Chinese, or even German or British efforts, is to ignore completely the local idiosyncrasies surrounding national research funding in Europe. If there is one area where subsidiarity has actually a meaning, it is in the distribution and the allocation of research funds, as reflected in the creation of the ERC and the substantial increase in its funding within Horizon 2020. So to put it mildly, I'm not impressed by the letter of the 72 Dutch Spinozists in defense of the current organizing structure of NWO. To put it less mildly, in my view, NWO should really be abolished as soon as possible and integrated within the ERC with the just retour clause for Dutch research funding efforts. Doing so within the Juncker Strategic Investment Initiative could even imply that NWO's large research infrastructure investments would no longer be taken into account in the Stability and Growth Pact assessment and hence become excluded from the 3% budgetary norm as was decided a couple of days ago. A pure win-win. But I didn't intend to discuss the future of Dutch research funding and its organization in any detail here and I already spent uh, far too much time on the issue. In this year's DS, I would like to focus on education. Ultimately, the bread and butter of what we are here for. An area where, if you allow me the non-scientific use of medical terms, one may wonder whether universities too are not suffering from spiritual Alzheimer. Forgetting what they are here first and foremost for contributing to the academic education and formation of students. An area which in these post-Charlie days highlights quite suddenly our particular role as university as, and I quote our strategic program here, bastion of openness, freedom of thought and freedom of speech. But also, if I may add, as higher education establishment in engaging students in standing for scientific debate tolerance and respect for other opinions. It is no surprise that education as inclusive activity and prisons and incarceration as excluding activity stand each in opposing ways at the forefront of the Charlie debate. Engaging students appears also a key factor in explaining the high study success figures we obtain here in Maastricht compared to other universities in the Netherlands. Engaging students was actually one of the main raison d'etre for the Rijksuniversiteit Limburg when it was set up within a spirit of the need for educational renewal also in higher education in the 70s. Our problem-based learning system originally taken over from McMaster University was indeed a pretty radical innovation in the teaching of medicine in the Netherlands. Today it has become standard practice in most other medical schools and departments in the world, even Harvard, and the other Dutch Harvard on the Meuse, Rotterdam. <laughs> but as only university in the Netherlands, we implemented PBL teaching across all disciplines as a common education philosophy, making education first and foremost a student-centered activity. In short, engaging students. 
Over the last decade, it led to several incremental innovations and improvements, such as the leading and learning micro-projects initiated by my predecessor here at Moles, and the Learning at Work program implemented within the study program of knowledge engineering aimed at fostering work experience within education. Innovation in education, such as problem-based learning, does, however, not allow itself to be structured and routinized in a timeless fashion. With the emergence of MOOCs, the Massive Open Online Course Network, with the word massive in the acronym, at first sight going in the exact opposite direction of our PBL student-centered education system, the question raised already three years ago by Wim Gijsenaars in his DS lecture of 2012 about the balance between the internal access to the knowledge within the group of students and the tutor and the outside knowledge available at the hands of a digital click has become much more pressing. How can and should we reform a closed student-centered and location-based education systems in a world, to use Jimmy Wales' words, in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge? Keeping pace with this extraordinary proliferation of information, of software tools, mobile apps, is challenging for students and teachers alike. For students, it effectively means that the massive amount of information, comments, reflections, outside of the student group is likely to be more valuable in discussing the particular problem issue in the PBL session than the comments of colleagues, students, and even the tutor. For teachers and educators, the question is how one can truly add to such open access to knowledge in terms of actual learning, sense-making, coaching, even credentialing. In short, how a new adapted PBL 2.0 can surmount, surmount the simple access to internet in obtaining information and new facts and become a truly learning process. As Sparrow and colleagues pointed out in a study on the effects of Google on memory, processes of human memory are adapting to the advent of new computing and communication technology. We are learning what the computer knows and when we should attend to where we have stored information in our computer-based memories. Developing under such conditions a new PBL 2.0 will be a tough task, actually a much tougher one than the setting up of a successful MOOC. The latter represents to some extent the digital form of best practice education performance, a carefully well-structured and regularly assessed online course allowing for stepwise progress with the course program given by a gifted teacher using all available visual and audio support systems open to all. As the success in attracting large number of students to follow such courses is witness to, the MOOC's road to increase the university's market share appears to many universities, both in the Netherlands and in the world, the ideal strategy to navigate the higher education perfect storm. Not though for the University of Maastricht. At first sight, our challenge looks more like the opposite. How to realize an ideal internalization of knowledge process within student group discussions, exploiting optimally the massive external knowledge available on each one's mobile, iPad, notebook, laptop, whatever. This can only be addressed through experimenting, to trial and error, as we heard this morning from Jimmy Wales, as was initiated through the many leading and learning micro-projects which have been carried out over the last five years. The challenge now is to upscale those best practice examples to become the building blocks of the PBL 2.0 of our university and to implement them across all faculties. A complex process, but one which in my view is essential. A decade or so ago, the logo of our university leading in learning was chosen. Whatever one may think of logos in the academic community which make self-claims, it is clear that while the claim might well have been correct at the time of its introduction, it is today being challenged. My colleague Martin Powell made a brave attempt two years ago to interpret the logo as something to remind each one of us every morning, like a prayer, that this was our mission. In my terms, a daily dose against educational spiritual Alzheimer. Well, if it worked, it didn't really become visible. So educational renewal will remain in the years to come a core challenge. To start experimenting how this can be further developed, we have created EdLab, the UM Institute for Education Innovation, which will be located on the Tapijn Caserne and will explore the broad spectrum 
of opportunities for further renewal and improvement of problem-based learning education. The involvement and engagement of students will lie at the heart of the EdLab initiatives and experiments, but EdLab will also require full engagement from teachers, researchers, managers and support staff. Ladies and gentlemen, our university is nearly 40 years old. A university, by the way, still younger than the average age of its staff. <laughs> we, do, we do have, possibly contrary to many much older universities, hence the institutional flexibility to change priorities as they evolved over the last three decades. I have laid out here what are some of the challenges in the field of education which we as Maastricht University will be confronted with in the years to come. <coughs> challenges which appear at first sight complex and not that easy to address. But challenges which represent little compared to the challenges universities and educational establishments are confronted with in other parts of the world and in particular in Africa. Let me in conclude draw your attention and ask for your support for the midwifery school in Makeni, Sierra Leone. A new school which with the help of Cordate and together with the Academy of Midwifery of, of South Hogeschool, we, the university, assisted in the development of the curriculum, the educational system and the training of staff. At this moment, the Ebola crisis is dramatically affecting the school after having lost several of their health personnel as a result of the Ebola infection. <coughs> How not to understand the frustration of the director's school when being confronted with healthcare workers being affected because of the lack of protective equipment? And how much more real than the adjustment and rebalancing problems I allowed myself to entertain you with here from this pulpit today? Thank you for your attention.